Grace, mercy, and peace to all of you from God our Father and for our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> the lesson for our meditation this morning is the gospel lesson read a moment ago from Matthew 28. And our sermon theme today is entitled The Great Co Mission. Dear friends and beloved brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. So the text today for Holy Trinity Sunday is the Gospel lesson, and it's informally known as the so-called Great Commission. <clears throat> and it's a pretty well-known passage, and it's an extremely important passage. Now, it's true that the words Great Commission aren't in the actual text, but it does accurately describe what's going on. Jesus, upon his ascension back into heaven, is commissioning his church to do the work of creating new disciples through the means of word and sacrament. But if we focus only on the commissioning itself, great as it may be, we would lose sight of the fact that behind this commission is an even greater co-mission. And that is the combined, cooperative, and perfectly coordinated mission of the three persons of the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The church's mission is rooted in it flows from and it finds its source in God's mission as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The real key to the church's mission and to community evangelism, which is what a lot of our message today will be about, the key to that is to understand, confess, and rejoice that the first and greatest missionary of them all is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, it's been a few years ago when our Senate released a document talking about outreach and evangelism, and it talked about the church's missions to reach the lost, and that statement gave four key points. And those are kind of the four points that this message will be about today. Point number one is an extremely important point, and that is that the mission to reach the lost begins in the heart of God the Father. Reaching the lost is of the most importance to God the Father. It is the will of the Father that everyone would come to the saving knowledge of the truth and that no one would perish. The Father is grieved deep in his heart every time somebody rejects him and therefore rejects his eternal life. And this heart for mission that the Father has had has been around since the very beginning. You heard the Old Testament lesson read a little earlier today from Genesis 1 and 2. And when you heard it, you read that God made a world according to His design, and that was a place of absolute perfection. And as you heard, all three members of the Trinity were present at creation. So Genesis 1 and 2 were great. And the things turned rather ugly in Genesis 3. Sin came into the world. Satan successfully got mankind to reject God's word. And now all of a sudden, sin, suffering, hatred, and death come rolling right on in. But it's extremely pivotal for understanding all of Scripture to look at how God reacted to Adam and Eve when man fell into sin. God did not banish Adam and Eve away from his, his care and his providence. He could have, but he didn't. He did not strike them down on the spot, zapping them into dust. He could have, but that's not what he did. Instead of rejecting and condemning Adam and Eve, the Father's missionary heart led him to promise to send a Savior that was going to fix the whole mess. So from literally the very beginning, God was interested only in saving and forgiving as opposed to destroying and condemning. According to Ephesians 1, God's missionary plan began before the very foundation of the world. And that is an extremely comforting truth. And so when you understand that, you then can see it play out in Scripture over and over again. If you spend any time reading Luke 15, you'll recall 
that there are three parables in Luke 15, all of which show God the Father's missionary heart. He describes us as lost sheep. He describes us as lost coins. And he is diligently and frantically searching to find us, and he rejoices exceedingly when he does find us. And then you have the parable of the prodigal son, and that shows that God the Father always, always welcomes his repentant children back, no matter what the circumstances might be. And of course, everybody knows John 3.16, but it's extremely important to know John 3.17. Which says that the Father sent Jesus so that the world would be saved through him. So missions and salvation are absolutely the will of the Father. That's what he wants. Okay, so God's mission starts with the Father. But the second point is that God's mission centers in God the Son, that is Jesus. The Father didn't seek to carry out His mission for saving the world from its sins by the power of His will. Instead, His plan depended on the cooperation and the commission of His Son. Jesus was willing to leave the comfort and splendor of heaven and come back to a sinful world that would reject Him and that would kill Him so that you and I would be saved through Him. From the beginning to the end, the Bible points to Jesus as Lord, and it is centered on the promise to send Jesus, and the promise to forgive through Jesus. In the second reading today that Pastor Jim read from Acts chapter 2, Peter said that the entire world is saved through the crucified and risen Jesus. There is not one single person on the planet that Jesus did not die for. Jesus was God in flesh, and at the same time, he was every bit as human as you and I. He had to be fully human because he came to take our place. He came to be one of us so that he could take our place in life and take our place in suffering and take our place in death. Jesus perfectly kept God's law, which we can't do. He did that on our behalf. Jesus' death was the all-sufficient sacrifice to the Father for the atonement of the sins of the entire world, present, past, future. So because of that now, you don't have to fear the wrath of God for your sins. You don't have to be afraid of the wrath of God because the wrath of God has already been poured out on Jesus. And Jesus' resurrection ensures your own resurrection. It won you eternal life, and it opened up the doors of heaven to all repentant believers, including you. Now, there's a, it can be kind of confusing, because there aren't a lot of false teachings in the world today about Jesus and Christianity. But the thing to remember is that Christianity is not based on how to make you into a better person. Christianity is not about you earning God's blessings and God's favor by being really good. And Christianity is not about your best life now. Christianity is about proclaiming that there is only one name under heaven and earth by which we are to be saved, and that name is Jesus Christ. Everyone who is repentant and believes in Jesus will not perish, but will have eternal life. Okay? So while God's mission to save us starts with the Father, and it is centered on the work of the Son, number three is it is empowered by God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also an eternal partner in God's co-mission of salvation. It's not like the Holy Spirit all of a sudden pops on the scene at Pentecost when he wasn't there before. Genesis 1 said he was there at the time of creation. I'll bring over the earth. The Bible says he was there when Jesus was baptized. And he filled and empowered the church on Pentecost, thus equipping the apostles in the early church. And that same Holy Spirit is equipping believers in the same way still today. Now, the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit is vital to missionary efforts because... 
All of us are of sinful nature, and that means that we could never, ever, ever believe in Jesus, repent of our sins, or have the slightest desire to see anyone else come to faith on our own. All of that is 100% the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit works through the means of grace, of word and sacrament, which is the focus of the work of the church, and that gives church its importance. The Holy Spirit working through the means happens here in God's house. The Holy Spirit is the Lord and giver of life. Because without the Holy Spirit, there ain't no life. Now, all of this is why evangelism doesn't have to be fearful. So many people are intimidated by the idea of evangelism. A little nervous about sharing their faith or talking about Jesus. Well, as the church, we are called to be messengers of Jesus, but bringing people to faith is done by the power of the Holy Spirit, not by the power of the church. The overwhelmingly difficult task of salvation is done in the overwhelmingly great power of God. The Holy Spirit gives us the love of God and the love of neighbor that we need. And the Holy Spirit gives us the desire and the strength to carry the love of God in Christ Jesus to a hurting, dying world. Because of the Holy Spirit, that's what we want to do now. Okay, so God's mission of salvation begins with the Father. It's centered on the work of the Son. And it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. But the fourth and the final point is a really big one. And that is the fact that God's mission to save is also our mission as the church. Only by recognizing the triune God as the first and greatest missionary can we then begin to understand the church's role in God's mission and joyfully and confidently participate in it. You see, God saved you for a reason. As God saved you, he gave you a call. And God has called you to share his gifts that you have been given with the whole world. See, on Sunday morning, you come into church, the pastor gives, the pastor gives, the pastor gives, and you receive, receive, receive. But as soon as you walk out the door, the roles are switched, and now all of a sudden, you're the giver, and the world receives. God has called you to be his spokesperson, and he's called you to be the mouthpiece of the people that are in your lives and to your community. The people that God has placed in your lives aren't there by pure chance or happenstance. They're there because God put them there. And he has called you to be his spokesman to them so that he can work in them also. So you are called to be the spokesperson of God to the people in your lives, to your community, and through the Holy Spirit, he equips you to fulfill that calling to his glory. So God calls the church into existence and he carries out his mission through the church in spite of all of the church's many imperfections. Think about what God said about you in 1 Peter 2, verse 9. He said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's chosen people, so that you may declare the wonderful deeds of him who have called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You have been saved, and you have been saved for a purpose, and that purpose is to be an instrument of God to save others. You are God's instrument to be used to expand his kingdom through his saving power, not yours. So on this Trinity Sunday, we praise God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for his awesome, gracious, and ongoing missionary work. That begun before the beginning of time and is continuing in and through us as we carry out his great commission. And do not trust in yourselves, but trust in God as you seek to share the good news of the Father's love in Jesus Christ with others by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until his second coming. Amen.
We now continue by confessing our faith.